Hello, I'm Michael Redman, professional Go player. In this video, I'm going to talk about the basics of playing Go on the 19x19 19 19 board. So maybe you've played some games on a smaller board, such as the 9x9 9 9 or the 13x13. 13 13. There are some links to videos in the description below. So if you want to see those first, you can watch those videos also. In this video, I'm going to show you the first 40 moves of a 19x19 19 19 game. And I'll be explaining the reasons why someone might want to play such moves. And so it's going to give you an introduction to how to play this game. To start with, Black is going to play the first move here in the upper right corner. This board, 19 by 19 grid, if you're playing at this size board the first time, it must look like a great expanse. And you might be confused as to where you want to start. I'm going to start by saying that the corners are very important. So when I say the corners, I should probably say corner areas because I'm talking about areas like this, uh, like this, these uh, areas that are adjacent to the corners. So it's about four lines away from the edge of the board. So these four corner areas are very important. The reason that these corner areas are important is because they're relatively easy to control. Basically, the edges of the board are creating two natural walls, which will help you surround the area and take control of it. And so Black plays this move in the corner area. And it's important that, first of all, that Black played a few lines away from the edge of the board. So for instance, if Black had played something like this, very close to the edge of the board, the stone you place on the board tends to control the open area below it. And so that's the open area closer to the edge of the board. So this black stone in the lower right corner only controls a tiny area there. And if white continues with a move on top of it, the white stone will control the general area and the black stone is going to be relatively inefficient. So it's good to play three or four lines away from the edge. And we have names for these moves that we like to play. But if you're just starting the game, you don't have to memorize any of these technical terms. You can just count the number of li lines from the edge of the board. So this is the three, four point that Black has played. It's three lines from the right side and four lines from the upper side. So it's a three, four point. And it's customary for Black to play the first move in the upper right part of the board. And when I say that, I mean the, the right half of the upper right quarter of the board. So it's um, I think I did a fairly good job of drawing a triangle around it. Uh, it's this area here, including the center point of the board. And usually black will play a move that controls the corner area. So to reduce that to moves that are popular, I'd say any of these nine moves would be acceptable or popular moves. But I'm going to recommend the three, four point and a move I'm going to show for white is this move. And this white move, you might notice there's a little dot there that we call the star point. And so this white move can be called the 4-4 four, four point, or it can be called the star point. This 3-4 point and this star point, or the 4-4 four, four point, these are the two most popular moves. And so I would suggest it's a good idea to start with these moves. There's no rule that says you have to play them. You can play other moves. You can even play in the center of the board. And no one's going to get upset about that. Uh, but it's going it's a lot easier to have success with these moves. So I'm going to suggest you should do that. When you play a move in the corner, you do have a local advantage. So white has a local advantage in this di direct area, and black has a local advantage in this direct area. And that's a reason that while it would be acceptable to attack your opponent's corner immediately, for instance, white could have played here, attacking the black corner, and it would have been a feasible move. The difference in value between this move and a move like this is actually very subtle. But I have found that this white move playing a different corner is um, much easier to execute and a better strategy in, in whole. So in most high level games, you will see the players taking control of two corners each, um, as is shown here. And I've given a mix of the three, four points and the four, four points or star points. Once you've controlled four corners like this, you come to the next step. 
After the corners, there are areas that we call the sides. And the sides are the areas, again, the same distance from the edge of the board. So it's about four lines away from the edge of the board and between the corners. So these are the four sides. I can mark this side, this side. We have four sides, which people start to play after the corners. And then this area in the center of the board is usually kept for last because it's relatively difficult to form groups or territories, areas in the center of the board. So it's a lot less efficient to surround territory there when you have to build four walls instead of the, just the two walls that you have to build in the corner of the board. So now the players have taken control of four corners, what happens next is usually you can add a stone to one of your own corner positions to make what is called a corner enclosure. So that would be black playing something like this. And uh, the popular moves here would be a move on a third line or a move on the fourth line like this. So it would be one of these two, or it could be further away from the corner. This move has become very popular in recent years, or it could be on the third line further away. So any of anything further away from the corner than these moves here would be considered a move on the side, and it's not a corner enclosure anymore. Corner enclosures are really good because they take a, an even stronger control and already are sort of mapping out lines here to control this corner area. And so with these two walls that Black is trying to create, Black has already established an, an area in the corner, which is controlled by Black. Otherwise, you can play a move that is attacking one of your opponent's corners, and this is called an approach move. So this is what black did. There's a line between this black stone and the white stone. We call it the one space approach move. And as I said before, uh, having played the first move in the corner, white has a local advantage. And that's why black is sort of keep, keeping the high ground here, staying on the fourth line so black is not going to be surrounded by white. White can use the local advantage to make some territory in the corner. So this is what white does with this attachment underneath. When white plays here, white is starting to build a borderline for white's territory, which is gonna look something like this at least. So this area inside these two blue lines towards the edge of the board is probably going to become white's territory. If black tries to cut the white stone off like this, this will be a fight where both sides are diagonal. So the diagonal here is cut off by the two diagonal stones that black has here. All of the stones are in danger, but when white has an advantage of one move here, white has an extra stone at this point, it means that white's going to have a local advantage in this fight. And in most cases, this is going to end badly for black. So I don't think black should be too aggressive here. And it's wise for black to play on the outside. And Black's object in this fight will be to create a position on the lower side. So when I say the lower side, I'm talking about this area of the board. In between the two white corners, if Black can build a position in this general area, it means that White's corners will not develop into a large territorial network that is connected up. Black is sort of getting in the way of, of White doing that. If Black gets a chance to continue with a move here, this would be attacking the white stone by putting it in the tari. This would be very dangerous for white. So it's important for white to pull back here to connect the white stone to the corner. So with this move, these two white stones are solidly connected. And these two white stones are in what is called a diagonal connection. And there's no way for black to cut that off at this point. The two black stones, which I've marked, are not connected yet. Because if white plays at the cutting point, which is here, white will be able to cut those two black stones off. And the diagonal is always dangerous, so you have to watch these diagonal connections. And when your opponent has a stone adjacent to that diagonal here, that means your opponent is ready to cut at this point. And this would be cut off. So black plays here to make a connection. So with this, the three black stones are connected. And black still has ideas of moving in this direction. So actually this whole sequence here 
is called a joseki, and that is a kind of a standard sequence, which is considered to be a sequence of good moves for both sides. And so it's something, it's sort of like an opening sequence in, in chess or other games. So when white plays here, the mark white stones are all on the third line, three lines away from the edge of the board. When you establish a boundary there, it is relatively easy to defend the boundaries towards the edge of the board. That's just the second and first line. If your opponent invades at the second or first line, in many cases, you're going to be able to chase that stone towards the edge of the board and capture it. So white's going to be able to surround the sides relatively easy, and we can envision a white territory that looks something like this. So this is how white established a concrete profit from white's local advantage in this corner. White has some territory there. Black finishes this local sequence by playing this extension and creating an area here on the lower side. So this square is an area that is, for the time being, controlled by black. And there are prospects that it will turn into a black territory. So if you get a territory like this, you won't have to be worrying about that black group. In the larger picture, black has created a relatively strong group here which is in between the two marked white stones, which were cornerstones that were controlling two corners. And by creating this group, black has stopped white from controlling that general area on the lower half of the board. Now white plays an approach move also. So we saw black playing an approach move on the fourth line. Uh, playing an approach move on the third line is also a very popular move, and it's a very effective move. So in the upper left corner here, I have marked four points which are the four points that an approach move is commonly played at. And they are also the four points that a corner enclosure is commonly played at. So black is going to play one of those points. Black played here. So this is a corner enclosure. So here we have an example of the high approach move, which was this one. The low approach move, which is this one. And I've shown you one of the corner enclosures. So just to go through the various corner enclosures that are popular. In the upper left corner here, it would be this one, or this one, this one, or this one. And any one of these moves is creating a very strong hold on the corner area. So for instance, this black one would be envisioning walls like this. Because when you have stones on the third or fourth line, they do tend to control the areas below them, and it will be difficult for white to come in underneath. So that area that I've surrounded there, is mostly likely to be a black territory. In the game, black chose this one. So when you create a corner enclosure, you have hopes to be making some territory here. But there's another reason for this move, is that by creating a strong group there in the upper left corner, black is also creating a kind of a base, which can expand towards this side or this side. And the fact that that black group in the upper left corner is strong, it means that black will have a strong base from which to expand. And that's important, because once you've finished fighting in the corners, the next step is that you move towards the sides. In this game so far, black has already moved towards the side once. And we're going to see in the near future, we're going to see the players moving toward sides like this. From black's point of view, black wants to move towards in the direction of those two arrows. White also wants to control side areas like this, and this can also be important. So white continued with this move. This is also a very popular move that I wanted to show you. It's White is pressing down on, on that black stone that I've marked. And black is in danger of being surrounded here. For instance, a good white move follow-up would be to play here. And this would put a lot of pressure on that, that single black stone. So it's good for black to be playing here and creating some space. So with this stone, black has started to create an area here. And white has built a line of stones that are kind of pointing out into the center. And this is called a wall. And it extends influence towards the left side here. So if white plays some kind of a move, which might be uh, something like this, then white is going to control that immediate area. For the time being, white played here. So this is one of the side areas. By playing here, white is getting a loose control 
over this area. And with the first move in the corner, white did have control over the corner. So this is still very loose control. We don't know if it's going to turn into a white territory or not. But uh, white does have the idea that this area is loosely controlled by white. And with this move, white is also limiting the expansion of this black position here. So it does have, does have double effect. So black played here. This is a direct attack on white's diagonal connection in the corner, and black is threatening to cut at the marked point. So these two white stones are diagonal. Until black played this move at the 4-4 point, they were perfectly okay, because when black plays there, all white has to do is connect here. But if white were to play elsewhere and allow black, black to cut here, it would be a problem. So white answers here, and white has maintained control over this general area. You can see black is starting to play on the left side. In the opening of Go, players generally start with the corner areas and then they spread to the sides and they start playing the middle of the board. Usually you call it the middle game at that point. So the opening is generally starting with the corners and then after that you move to the sides. With these two moves, uh, this first one here is called the kick, when it is a direct attack on the black stone and is threatening to play here, which would be putting a lot of pressure on that black stone. Black extends towards the center, and now white plays here. With these two moves, white has established a loose connection between all of these white stones. And by doing that, it's relatively easy to protect the border lines towards the edge of the board. So white is imagining that this whole area is going to be white's territory. And it is likely that this area is going to be a white territory here. Black continues with this move, which is starting to take control of the side. So it's very similar to the move that black played here. There is a gold proverb, or a kind of a rule of thumb that says, if you have a wall of two stones, which in this case is these two black stones, it's a good idea to extend three spaces. So this is a three space extension and that's because there's three lines between it and the black wall. And white extended on the upper side. So with this move white is controlling this area and with the wall on the right here white does have some potential to expand this into the center. So there's this pattern of starting with the sides and having ideas of expanding that into the center later. It's much easier to surround territory in the center of the board when you have a base on the side of the board. So when black plays this move, I'm going to say that all of the important side points have been taken. And this might be a bit surprising because there's some areas here and there seems to be a, a little bit of area here that are not quite filled up. One reason I'm not emphasizing areas like this is because they're relatively less space. So the space between this black stone and this white stone is smaller than most of the moves that we've played so far. Also, there's the fact that, for instance, this white group, it's actually a very solid or strong group because white has already established an area here. And there's no way that black can effectively attack this white group. It makes moves in the adjacent area here, uh, the value of these moves will be relatively small. Because when you play a move, you want to control a large area with it, or you want to have potential to attack your opponent's stunts. And similarly, this black group, um, it's starting to map out an area something like this in the upper right corner, and it's not going to be in any immediate danger. So I'm going to say that this side area is relatively small. And white's next move, for instance, on the lower side, would probably be something like this, maybe. And this would expand white's territory here. And it would take away some of black's territory here. But you might notice that this white stone is on the second line, the second line from the edge of the board. And just look at the moves I've been playing up to this point. There were no moves on the second line of the board. And that's another thing that's worth remembering, is that, in general, you don't want to play on the second line too early in the game. 
uh, moves on the second line generally start to be played in the middle game. So it's not as if there's any rule about that, but it's just that the moves on the second line will control less area than moves on the third or fourth lines. And I didn't mention moves further away from the edge. If you go too far away from the edge of the board, the control you have over anything below that becomes very weak. And so moves um, six or seven lines away from the edge of the board are very rare in the beginning of the game. So you can see that the moves are, are just three or four lines. Almost all of these stones that I've played are three or four lines away from some edge of the board. At this point, the game starts to edge towards the middle game. And this is because, as I said, the side areas have been, the big moves have been taken. And also there's the fact that if we look at Black's structure there on the left side of the board, Black has started with a group here and a solid corner and closer there and it extended to the side. So these lines sort of demonstrate uh, Black's strong positions, and Black is going to try to connect those positions. Ideally, Black would connect it with a line of stones, something like this, and would surround a huge area on the left side of the board. If Black manages to do that, in most cases, this would win the game for Black. So it's about time for White to do something about that and find a way to invade the left side of the board. So I'm going to show you an example of how that might happen. This is a point where you sort of change the way you think, and we're going to stop surrounding areas, but White is going to concentrate on how, how to make a group that looks somewhat healthy inside this area here. A good way to do that is to play forcing moves, or moves that your opponent is going to answer. And that's the way White went about it, by playing here. White is threatening to break into Black's corner area here. And it's very natural for Black to want to defend that. So Black played here. And White is again threatening to break into the Black corner territory. And it's natural for Black to defend that. And in this sequence here, Black has established what I was calling an area before. Now I'm going to call this area, I'm pretty sure it's going to be Black's territory. So this area, the general area here, um, is going to be a Black territory. Black has actually gained locally by making a fairly solid position there. But white also has gotten some extra stones here, which are going to help white to create some kind of a group. And with this final move at uh, C12, white is threatening to slide into black's area in the lower half of the left side of the board. So there, there's this area here, which is potentially going to be black's territory. And if white can slide into it, for instance, if black plays on top, this is also a, a good shape move. But if white gets to slide into the black territory there, when I look at it, I can say that it looks like white's going to have room to make two eyes. So white can make a territory there at the edge of the board. At this point of the game, suddenly the players have started to play on the second line. That's because we're in the middle game where you are more interested in making uh, space on, in relatively small areas and you do find yourself playing some moves on the second line of support. So black doesn't want to give white this area here, and this would reduce the black territory in this immediate area also. So what black did was black played here. And with this move, black has already established a square area of what looks like territory in on this side. Also, black has um, denied the opportunity for white to make very much space on the side here. It's a bit cramped. So white starts by running out into the center. And black is putting pressure on the white group there. White is going to run out a little bit more. And at this point, white started to make a base. So this is um, the end of the first stage of the game. Now white has some area here. And when I look at it, I would say that this is usually going to be enough area for white to eventually make two eyes and have a living shape there. But in the case that that doesn't work out so well, white does still have some room to escape out into the center. So once white has played this move at B15, establishing some space here, 
I'm going to say that this white group is settled for the time being. And the, the basic uh, plan for the game, the outline, you might say, is already shown in, in these opening moves. And we have various areas that are strongly controlled by the players. So for instance, this area is strongly controlled by black. This area is strongly controlled by black. And this area. And there's an open side here, but maybe this area too. So that's, that's kind of a maybe. And this area is controlled by white. This area controlled by white. And there's some areas like these that are probably going to end up being white territory too. So when I say a, an area is controlled by one player or the other, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's 100% going to be a territory, but is a high prob probability. So we have the idea that of these territories that are being formed. And now, after this, the players can focus on what happens to the center of the board, because it's so much more efficient to build on the sides. Uh, so after you build the sides, you start thinking about the center. So in this middle game, Black's next idea is probably how to expand this area, and this area, and maybe this area, which is uh, an area that Black seems to have some surrounding stones. If we just look at these black stones and these black stones, if black can succeed in cleverly connecting up these two groups, maybe black is going to have a chance to control some area in this part of the board. I think these two groups would form at least two or three walls surrounding the center. So that will be the next stage of the game. I might make a video talking about that part of the game also to con continue this game into the middle game. So thank you for watching. This was my explanation of how to play Go on the 19 by 19 board. And I will be making more Go videos like this. So subscribe to my channel if you want to see more. Thank you for watching.